I'm going to talk to you today about my journey away from home to the South Pole, which took me 10 and a half months of time that I spent there. That sounds like a lot, long time, but my journey was a lot easier than the journey of the early Antarctic explorers. This is a photo from the Endurance Expedition, which was run by Sir Ernest Shackleton. And he put out an advertisement in a London newspaper wanting 27 men to experience bitter cold, low wages, harsh conditions, total darkness, and uncertain return. These men responded to that advertisement, and indeed it was a very difficult expedition. They sailed to Antarctica in 1914, and their ship got stuck in the ice, and then later crushed by the ice in the spring. And they had to pile into lifeboats and split up their party to search for rescue. 17 months later, they were back in the UK, in London. My journey was a lot easier, even with the minus 100 degrees. This is a photo of the plane that I got to take to Antarctica. Nowadays, the US operates three Antarctic bases, two on the coast of Antarctica, McMurdo Station and Palmer Station, and one in the very center of this vast continent, the South Pole Station. To give you a sense of scale, Antarctica is bigger than Australia. It's about the size of the US and Mexico combined. It's a huge continent, and it's all ice. The center of the continent is about 800 miles from any civilization if by civilization you mean a, a town of about a thousand people on the coast at a base. I got to travel there not for fundamental exploration, but for science. I work as a physicist at Caltech, an astrophysicist, and you might have heard of Caltech on the TV show, The Big Bang Theory. On that show, that show is actually based upon life at Caltech. Now, I'm no Sheldon. Scientists come in all shapes and sizes, even purple hair. It's natural, I swear. Um, <laughs> but uh, I got to, to work on a telescope called the South Pole Telescope, located at the South Pole, because of the conditions there. High, dry, remote from civilization were very conducive to doing science. And not just astrophysics, which I work on, but also climate science. A lot of the data from climate science is coming from this pristine conditions. Um, we study at the South Pole uh, the Aurora Australialis, the southern version of the Aurora Borealis, and a variety of other sciences. Um, because of the pioneering work of these Antarctic explorers, I got to travel to Antarctica as a scientist. This is me in the dish of the South Pole Telescope, and this is just to give you a sense of scale. It's about 30 feet, this entire dish, and myself and another winter over, it's called, were tasked with being part of a skeleton crew of 46 people. The two of us were the only people responsible for this telescope, making sure it was operational, fixing it when it went down, telescope doctors, essentially, and also doing a lot of the data analysis and making sure that the scientific data that we were collecting was useful to the entire scientific community. The rest of the crew weren't all scientists. There's a fantastic station at the South Pole that houses up to 150 people during the three months of summer in which planes can come in and out, the station can be refueled, and scientists can do fundamental upgrades to their experiments. Just a few people stay for the rest of the nine months to keep those experiments running, and I had the privilege of being one of those people. The telescope I worked on was about a kilometer, two-thirds of a mile from the South Pole Station, this comfortable building, which is a bit like a college dorm room or maybe like a prison, depending on your perspective. <laughs> um, in that, you're essentially trapped inside the majority of the time, and you have small beds that you're often um, uh, having to do communal work to get cooking done. Everyone did communal cleaning, et cetera, at the South Pole Station. I did get the chance to get out of the house. It wasn't like a prison in that respect. The weather was more uh, keeping us inside the house. Um, to travel to my telescope, um, every single day. During the summertime, uh, the South Pole has six months of total light where it doesn't get dark at all. 
And during those six months, you can travel to the sites outside of the station via a variety of mechanisms. Here's me on a snowmobile. Um, during the winter months, however, we have to just bundle up and walk. It would usually take me about 20 minutes to walk, and the conditions could be anywhere from minus 20 if it was warm to minus 100 or even lower if it was cold. And no matter what, uh, in Antarctica, you can bundle up and you can survive those temperatures. In fact, sometimes I even got hot. You can be happy outside as well. Here, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm smiling in this photo. <laughs> Um, so you can enjoy the temperatures as well. And what you also enjoy is the beautiful views. During the six months of total darkness in which the station is cut off uh, from any rescue or planes, any support, the walks that you take outside are almost always starry and often with this beautiful aurora australialis in the sky to keep you company along the cold walk. So as I mentioned, we are at the South Pole to do this science because it was an ideal location, very close to space. And the science that we are doing at the South Pole is looking at the baby photo of the universe. Here you have a plot of all of the history of the universe from left to right. We have the Big Bang on the left and the present day on the right if you're looking at the photo. And after the Big Bang, the universe was expanding and cooling and eventually it became transparent, as if on a foggy day, suddenly it clears up. And from that point on, light has been traveling to us, and we can view it today with very, very sensitive telescopes and electronics, such as the South Pole Telescope. Here I am indoors in the plumbing section of the South Pole Station, and it's minus 50 degrees inside. Um, even that, wasn't cold enough to run the South Pole Telescope. Because of the very faint nature of the radiation we are trying to observe, this baby photo from the Big Bang, which can tell us about the history of the universe, it can help us observe galaxy clusters, and tell us about the future of the universe. Will it continue expanding forever, or will it collapse to another Big Bang called the Big Crunch? Um, the data at the South Pole Telescope helps us understand the answers to that. But because the radiation is so faint, we actually need to use properties of superconductivity to sense it. And to do that, to use properties of superconductivity, you have to have extremely cold temperatures. And minus 100 isn't even cold enough. You have to be just a fraction of a degree above absolute zero. So one of my tasks at the South Pole, one of the coldest places on Earth, was to maintain and operate a refrigerator. Um, so I, en I enjoyed the irony of, of that operating a refrigerator on one of the coldest places on Earth. Um, this is my beautiful telescope operating and scanning the sky. Because again, the radiation is so faint, just like if you try to take a photo in very, very dark light, you want a very long exposure. Our photos would take three months, six months, years to take, um, where the telescope would scan the sky. And only later would scientists such as myself and an entire team of people go and analyze the data and come up with our conclusions. So I helped collect that data throughout an entire season. And finally, I had been there since January. Finally, in September, this is September 13th, the sun began to rise. And sunrise at the South Pole isn't an hour-long process or two-hour-long process. It's a month-long process. And when that sun first rises, uh, you have an immediate mood boost when you first see that, that flicker of, of hope, that flicker of home on the horizon. Um, that the sun will rise again. Finally, planes came for the first time. This is me with my first fresh fruit in many, many months. I'm extremely excited there um, to have fresh fruit. It's amazing what you miss. I miss certain smells. You miss fruit. I had a friend who um, was engaged, and they asked him at the end of the season, who did you miss, what did you miss most? And he said, fruit. And he said, no, wait, don't print that say, my fiance. <laughs> so it, it, it really is amazing how much you miss these super, uh, 
simple things that we take for granted in our everyday lives, like fiancés and fruit. Um, <laughs> uh, I was very happy um, to see people again and um, to have been a part of this modern day scientific achievement that was really enabled by the early explorers who went to Antarctica and paved the way for modern scientists to help us understand the future of the planet, to help us understand the future of the universe, in my case. Antarctica has this mythic weight. It resides in the collective unconscious of so many people, and it makes this huge impact, just like outer space, like going to the moon. This quote is by the author of Into the Wild, an author and also a mountaineer. And I chose this quote because I wanted to emphasize that I do believe that Antarctica is like outer space and that today we are in space research, in space exploration, in that heroic age of space exploration with companies like SpaceX and Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Blue Origin, et cetera, and with governmental agencies like NASA and the European space agencies. Um, the advertisements they're putting out for jobs are much like the, the jobs of the early days of Antarctic exploration. Um, uncertain return hazardous conditions. But the science they're doing today will really enable um, the science tomorrow. And here's me, a photo of me training in a zero gravity simulator at the NASA Johnson Space Center. I had the chance to interview to be a NASA astronaut. Unfortunately, I wasn't selected. I'm going to apply again in the future but I got to meet a lot of astronauts and a lot of people involved in the space program. And I'm convinced that the heroic work that they are all doing today will enable a future where, just like we have a base in Antarctica, where scientists can travel and do fundamental research, we will have a future where we have bases on the moon, on Mars, maybe even elsewhere in the solar system. I believe that will happen in our lifetime if we value the work that these explorers are doing today. And I'm very excited for a future in which our sons and daughters can travel and do science on the moon or science on Mars. And I'm hoping to be in the audience and listen to their TED talk, TEDx talk one day. Thank you very much.